were projection of this peaceful vision. We've heard a fair amount about that in the previous uh, panel. <coughs> this projection, notably by the EU, but not only by the EU, was accompanied by reformulations of the understanding of power towards normative power, civilian power, or, as we heard in the earlier panel, transformative power. Um, I admit I have absolutely 
absolutely no idea what goes on in Putin's mind. I don't think I would want to know either. And I, I, I know that what you, any of my colleagues has any particular idea of what's going on in here. Um, there are people who help. Uh, I suggest, however, that Putin aside, um, despite his idiosyncrasies, if you will, um, he reflects important historical, cultural, and social understandings and structures in the Russian Federation and in the Russian elite. There are uh, several important aspects in the Putin period. First, uh, Russia restored the vertical uh, and cre recreated, if you will, a more or less effective state uh, with growing military capabilities that had atrophy um, beforehand. It has substantial uh, resources to build, to rebuild the state's capacity. In other words, whereas the aspiration to control what goes on in the former Soviet Union, that aspiration has existed for a long time. Russia now also has capacity is sufficient to pursue it with a degree of probability of success. Second, um, I suspect that the logic of Russian behavior departs significantly from ours, the logic I described earlier. That may be why uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel was heard to say several months ago that uh, after a long uh, and I gather frustrating telephone conversation with Mr. Putin that Mr. Putin lives in a different world. Um, I guess in some respects he does. It's certainly the case that the Russian understanding of how regional and international politics work departs significantly from the European model described earlier. The Russian analysis seems to focus on territoriality, control of territory, uh, in a system defined by geopolitics or power politics, a zero sum uh, game, if you will. But it's not only about uh, power, I think it's also about status uh, and recognition. Russians, Russia, the Russian leadership believes it is a great power and that it should be treated as a great power. It interprets the inroads of Western institutions and regions not only as a power political. But also as Russia, uh, sorry, as the West trying to take advantage of Russian weakness and ignoring Russian status in the international system. That's not just, by the way, in the region. It's also clear in their uh, commentary on, for example, Kosovo and uh, Libya, the UN intervention in Libya, the NATO intervention in Kosovo. From this point of view. It's Surprising that Russia would consider NATO enlargement to be a threat to its national security. Um, and uh, that was clearly a major factor underpinning Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008. That expansion, by the way, uh, sorry, that uh, invasion, to my mind, ended prospects for further eastward expansion of NATO for the foreseeable future. As Russia has moved towards uh, economic uh, uh, reconsolidation, or at least a more serious effort at regional economic consolidation uh, through the establishment of the regional customs union, it's not surprising that they should extend their threat perception from NATO onwards to the European Union. Hence their efforts to force all the uh, EU partnership program in the lead up to the 2013 Vilnius summit convincing Armenia to back away from association, convincing Yanukovych to back away, and when uh, he backed away a little bit too far into uh, southern Russia, um, intervening, annexing Ukraine and intervening in Estonia, uh, annexing Crimea and intervening in Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, time chairman is moving on, so what's the bottom line here? Uh, Russian behavior in Ukraine is a violation of norms of territorial integrity to which Russia committed key instruments. The same, by the way, goes for recognition of the residents of Lusatia. Their actions in eastern Ukraine violate norms and law concerning sovereignty and self-determination. That's 
well as law concerning the aggressive use of force. Their actions are creating sizable externalities, a booming humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. Uh, eventually, someone is going to have to pay the bill for Ukraine's reconstruction because the odds that Ukraine will be able to pay it are pretty close to zero. Um, the financial black hole in Ukraine is getting deeper every day. <clears throat> Ukrainian implementation of the association with the EU basically depends on acquiescence from Russia, which may not be forthcoming. And uh, there is a possibility of uh, the Russians repeating the Ukrainian performance in uh, partnership countries that did sign the association. Um, we find ourselves in one of them. The Russian Federation uh, is uh, violating the principle of equal security as well. Leave aside democracy, economic liberty, the rule of law, fundamental freedoms, and so on. My point, there is a fundamental difference of view over what European security should look like, what principles it should be based on, and what that framework uh, should be. As a friend of mine um, once put it in a rather sardonic reference to the Charter of Paris, we spoke of one Europe whole and free, and this guy said, yes, well, one Europe whole and free ain't what it used to be. Um, I've suggested in short uh, that the boundaryless model of European security community proposed at the end of the Cold War was always more of an aspiration than a reality. In particular, it never succeeded in including uh, Russia, thereby leaving a huge risk on the edge. Um, you mentioned you bring in earlier in Georgia, suggested it's no longer possible. Uh, uh, the the, the, the post Cold War European model is no longer credible in security terms. The question then is what should you replace it with? Um, that's happily uh, uh, another time. So I don't have to, I don't have to deal with that. Um, but uh, one last thought. More broadly, events in and around Russia and Ukraine highlight the dangers of relying on soft power or normative power, and the possibility of the return to the historical pattern of geopolitical competition characteristic of the long run, uh, long run of European history. This is not a new Cold War. Um, this is being Cold War is global. Russia's military capability is substantially smaller than before. It has an economy of <coughs> Italy. Its economy is shrinking rather than expanding. And there's no ideological component to the current confrontation. This is about uh, territory and power. Um, and status. But uh, leaving Cold Wars aside, we're in for a tough ride. 